So uh, this is Srav Vagunta. She's uh, one of our wonderful interns. Uh, she's currently on her ophthalmology elective. Um, she um, was one of the people that we're really happy to have matched here, and she's definitely demonstrated a lot of enthusiasm during her, um, since we now have four interns, uh, the interns get some ophthalmology elective time, and she's been really proactive in figuring out you know, good ways to use her time uh, learning from all different kinds of people, so she may approach you and ask to uh, work with you as well. And today she's speaking about neuromyelitis optica spectrum disorders. Thanks, Eileen. Good morning, everyone. Um, so today I'm going to start off with a case presentation, then I'll talk about the diagnostic criteria for neuromyelitis optica spectrum disorders, or NMO spectrum disorders. And the most important thing I'll discuss today is how to distinguish between NMO spectrum disorders and other demyelinating diseases, especially uh, multiple sclerosis. Since the two diseases seem to present similarly, but they actually have very distinct pathophysiological mechanisms, and the treatment for them um, chronically is different. So two weeks ago, I met a patient in neuro-ophthalmology clinic, um, a 72-year-old Caucasian female from Idaho. Uh, she had a previous history of multiple sclerosis, and um, she presented three days after she had sudden onset, painless, uh, right eye visual field deficit. And she didn't have any other neurological symptoms at the time. In her relevant past medical history, at age uh, 40, she had an episode of difficulty walking for about six months, which gradually improved over time. Um, at, age, at age 50, she had a loss of vision in her left eye, also painless, um, and her vision decreased to no light perception. Uh, fortunately, she gained some, regained some vision in her periphery, but she remained at count fingers at one foot. Um, at that time, she had an MRI of her brain that showed brain plaques, and she was uh, diagnosed with uh, multiple sclerosis at the time, and started on Capaxone, uh, chronic immunosuppressive therapy. So here's uh, uh, her exam findings. Um, the most important findings are listed in the, in the yellow here. So her visual acuity was 2050 and in her right eye, the affected eye, and she was able to pinhole to 2040. In the left eye, she remained at count fingers, which is a chronic uh, change for her. Um, in her pupil, in her right eye, it was round and reactive. The left eye had a significant RAPD. And uh, Ishihara color plate testing showed that she had diminished color um, perception in the right eye and uh, virtually absent in the left eye. Uh, the rest of her slit length exam was relatively normal. On dilated fundus exam, um, you can see here that she had uh, temporal pallor and telangiectasias of her right side optic nerve and significant optic nerve swelling on OCT RNFL, superiorly, temporally, and inferiorly. On the left eye, she had significant nerve pallor and um, OCT RNFL showed uh, atrophy as well. She had a, a macular hole, and both maculae showed uh, RPE changes. On um, visual field testing, her golden visual field on her left eye, uh, which, which was chronically affected, showed a sequocentral scotoma and an inferior scotoma. And on um, right eye Humphrey visual field, uh, she had a sequocentral scotoma. Two weeks later, when she came back for her follow-up, her visual field had progressed to, a, to include a superior altitudinal defect as well. So given our case presentation uh, of a patient who presented with right eye, sudden onset, uh, painless vision loss, our differential included ischemic changes, so arteritic or non-arteritic, uh, compressive optic neuropathy, inflammatory causes uh, such as multiple sclerosis or NMO or spectrum disorders, or other demyelinating diseases, or even an infectious etiology. So she was worked up for the differential, and um, the only the, the only real um, positive lab finding was um, an elevated aquaporin 4 IgG antibody, which is also known as uh, NMO or neuromyelitis optica IgG. Um, I should also mention that the patient had uh, was treated with IV methylprednisolone, and her MRI findings didn't show any significant uh, nerve inflammation of her optic nerve. So this brings us to our discussion of uh, what is neuromyelitis optica and what are the spectrum disorders specifically. Um, so there are multifocal CNS demyelinating diseases that mainly affect the optic nerve and spinal cord. And they have an interesting history. Um, in 19, or sorry, 1894, DeVick published the uh, case report of a patient who presented with simultaneous optic neuritis and myelitis. Um, so this disease is often called DeVick's disease as well. Um, in the same year, his student published a case series of patients who presented similarly. Then uh, fast forwarding about 100 years to the optic neuritis treatment trial, 
Um, in this study, over 400 patients were enrolled, and only 10% of the patients in 1992 uh, had a diagnosis of multiple sclerosis. If you um, look at the results 15 years later that were published in 2008, about 50% of patients had multiple sclerosis, but there's really no for further investigation of patients who had neuromyelitis optica. One of the reasons might be because it was, it's a rare disease, but also because um, neuromyelitis optica was often considered a, just a subset or another variant of multiple sclerosis itself. Uh, but this changed in 2004 when Lennon and his colleagues uh, published a groundbreaking paper which identified the NMO antibody, um, the IgG antibody, which showed that it was, uh, NMO was actually a distinct pathophysiological disease and also was, could be tested for objectively. And the fact of physiology of the disease is pretty interesting, too. And it's also distinct from multiple sclerosis, <coughs> which I'll go over. Um, so the main um, target in, by, of the aquaporin-4 antibodies is the aquaporin-4 protein. The, it's, it's a water channel that's most abundant in the CNS, especially in the optic nerve and spinal um, cord. And um, these water channels help maintain homeostasis, especially in times of uh, physiological stress. And they mostly line the plasma membranes of the astrocyte foot processes, which line the blood-brain barrier here. So in this image, the aquaporin-4 antibodies, you can see them, somehow they cross the blood-brain barrier, attach onto the um, aquaporin-4 proteins themselves, complement is activated. And um, this attracts uh, neutrophils and eosinophils to the area and causes astrocyte death. The local inflammatory reaction then causes um, necrosis of the tissue in, in the same area, and especially oligodendrocytes can also be affected. So the mechanism of demyelination is actually uh, secondary to local necrosis itself. This is different from um, multiple sclerosis, where the main inflammatory target is the myelin itself, myelin protein itself. So um, that's more of a direct uh, mechanism of demyelination. So now that we know the pathophysiology, how do you diagnose the disease? In 2015, Wingerchuk and colleagues published this international consensus criteria for diagnosing NMO spectrum disorders. And one of the um, main points they make early on in the paper is that we should get rid of the term NMO. And the term NMO should just be subsumed under the term neuromyelitis optica spectrum disorders. So it's not really a list of disorders, but just uh, kind of like a spectrum of, of uh, the same pathophysiology. Uh, they established diagnostic criteria, and they also set up um, some, or made some suggestions for how to test for the disease, uh, which specific antibody tests to use. So for patients who have been diagnosed, uh, or who have a positive or elevated aquaporin-4 uh, IgG, they should have at least one of the following clinical, core clinical criteria that are listed here in order to be diagnosed with neuromyelitis optica. So they can present with either optic neuritis or acute myelitis, or another uh, uh, characteristic brain stem syndrome. And this is the most uh, significant change to the diagnostic criteria right here. So patients don't necessarily have to present with the first two. They could have a dorsal medullary syndrome, which is uh, also like a uh, area postrema syndrome. They could present with intractable hiccups or unexplained nausea or vomiting. Um, they could have an acute brain stem syndrome, an acute diencephalic syndrome, which could include the hypothalamus or the thalamus itself. Um, or even a cerebral syndrome. And these last two should also have MRI findings that support the criteria. So, um, there are some patients who are diagnosed with uh, neuromyelitis optica spectrum disorders without having a positive aquaporin-4 IgG. In that case, they all, the Wingerchuk and his colleagues also made suggestions uh, for how to diagnose those patients. They need to meet more of these, these clinical criteria, and they should also have uh, additional MRI findings to support the diagnosis. Okay. So in, in their paper, they also discuss um, uh, distinguishing uh, characteristics on MRI and or imaging findings to, to differentiate between NMO spectrum disorders and um, MS. So here's a, a classic picture of multiple sclerosis. This is the classic Dawson fingers that we see. This is a sagittal flare showing these um, colossal septal hyperintensities that are perpendicular to the lateral ventricles. Um, in comparison, the NMO spectrum disorders it don't necessarily have perpendicular um, hyperintensities. This is a, an image that's an axial uh, T1 with contrast. You can see in the deep white matter in the temporal lobe here, there's this uh, lesion that's, that's um, enhancing in a cloud-like pattern. And that cloud-like pattern is really specific for NMO spectrum disorders. 
So despite some of the distinguishing characteristics on MRI, um, over 15% of patients who have NMO spectrum disorders still meet MRI criteria for MS uh, diagnosis. This is a really important slide for us to go over, which compares the differences between MS and NMO um, spectrum disorders. So firstly, the prevalence of the two diseases is very different. Um, for NMO spectrum disorders, they're, they're much rare, more, more rare. Um, the initial course of both diseases um, is similar, though. They often, patients often present with a relapsing remitting course, so they have an attack to their uh, central nervous system. Then they recover incompletely, but for some time, and then they have another attack of their central nervous system. Um, interestingly, uh, NMO spectrum disorder patients, about 15% of them present with this monophasic uh, presentation. And in that situation, they have just one hit to their CNS, and they tend to recover over time. Um, but we're starting to find that these patients uh, are oftentimes negative for the aquaporin 4 IgG, and we're finding that they're usually a, young, a younger subset of patients, and they uh, tend to have an, a positive myelin oligodendrocyte glycoprotein as well. So we might find that these patients end up having a completely separate disease in the future. Um, the CSF findings uh, for both diseases are different. So NMO spectrum disorder patients tend to have more white blood cells and pleocytosis. And um, in the CSF of MS patients, we often see more often uh, the ligo clonal bands. Um, and then in NMO spectrum disorders, uh, it's common to see patients with other systemic autoimmune diseases, especially connective tissue diseases like um, uh, lupus or Sjogren's. And as we know, lupus itself can cause neuromyelitis, or sorry, uh, optic neuritis. Um, bilateral optic neuritis is most common, or more common in uh, neur neuromyelitis optica. And visual recovery is often worse for patients uh, who have neuromyelitis optica. So in, in the study where um, patients were followed five years after a near, uh, an optic neuritis episode, over 50% of patients after five years had worse than 2200 vision, which is unfortunate. Um, this is not really comparing apples to apples, but in the optic neuritis treatment trial where over 50% of patients had multiple sclerosis, um, only 4% had less than 2200 vision, so much worse visual outcomes with uh, neuromyelitis optica. So um, now that we know some distinguishing characteristics, how, who should we actually test for the aquaporin-4 IgG antibody? So in, if you look at patients who've had um, a, just one episode of optic neuritis and no other neurologic history, only 3 to 5% of those patients end up being positive for the aquaporin-4 IgG, so it's pretty rare. Um, but we should consider testing patients who have any of the two clinical characteristics that I mentioned earlier. So, for example, a patient who has optic neuritis plus an acute brainstem syndrome. Um, patients who have bilateral visual symptoms, like we saw, uh, more likely to have neuromyelitis optica spectrum disorders. And um, recurrent optic neuritis with poor visual outcomes is also another reason to test. And finally, patients who have concurrent autoimmune diseases. So um, which test should you use uh, to test for this uh, antibody? Or antibody? Um, thankfully, uh, there's over 40 uh, assays out there, but thankfully the international consensus criteria recommended, made some recommendations, and they suggested doing the live uh, cell binding assay, since it has the highest sensitivity and specificity of, of the other tests. At um, AREP, at the University of Utah, we have ELISA with reflex to immunofluorescence assay, but as you can see, it's less sensitive. So there's a risk of false, positive in pa false positives in patients who um, could have low titers of the antibody itself. So what we do here is we test with the ELISA, and then if positive, we can confirm by sending out to the Mayo Clinic for a, a cell-based or cell-binding assay. So the treatment of NMO um, has been studied, but mostly in um, retrospective studies and, and in small populations. So the, the evidence isn't, uh, isn't that well supported, but it's the best that we, can, best that we have so far. Um, so the first line treatment is uh, methylprednisolone, uh, high dose uh, IV for five days, and then with an oral steroid taper. And um, finally, for chronic immunosuppressive therapy, um, this brings us back full circle for why we should um, help, dis why, we, why it's important to distinguish between MS and NMO spectrum disorders. Because certain medications that, ca that are used for immunosuppressive therapy in MS patients can actually um, uh, worsen or uh, not adequately prevent relapses in patients with NMO. Um, and these include uh, natalizumab, interferon beta, and fingolimod. 
We don't really know exactly why these uh, don't adequately prevent those relapses in patients, but for interferon, pa interferon beta, we know that um, it's possible that the uh, T helper cells are, um, are sort of increased in number, and they in turn activate the B, B, uh, B cells, and those B cells, of course, produce the um, uh, immunoglobulins themselves. So the best therapy for patients is to do um, rituximab or azathioprine. Rituximab has become a favorite lately because um, it's more, it has a better th therapeutic index, it reaches a therapeutic index faster than uh, azathioprine and mycophenolate, um, and it has uh, fewer side effects overall, and the dosing is easier, so patients only have to have dosing every uh, six months. Um, and then in the future, we can look forward to more specific therapies uh, like aquaporumab. Uh, these are, this is a small molecule binding inhibitor to prevent the binding of the um, IgG to the uh, protein itself. So, uh, thanks for your attention. I'd like to especially thank Drs. Degree, Neufeld, and Wang for helping me with this presentation and taking care of our patient. So false positive is linked to specificity, right? You know, the specificity is very high for all those tests. So I think the likelihood of having a false positive with any of these tests is low. It's the, the problem is getting a false and negative because of the sensitivity of the tests are poor. Yeah, that's true. Right? Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Uh, so sensitivity is used for ruling out diseases. So yeah. yeah, so yeah. Even, in a, even with the best test, the sensitivity is still in the mm -hmm. 80%, which means that if, you know, five people come into your clinic who really have an MO, one of them you're going to misdiagnose mm -hmm. if, you, if you rely completely on the test. So even this test, which has you know, uh, really changed our ability to quickly diagnose this disease, um, you still have to think clinically. Mm -hmm. You can't rely on the test. And then could you also show the outcome table you put together? Mm -hmm. which, uh, yes. Mm -hmm. I think part of the reason that people with Neuromyelitis on the spectrum has such poor visual acuities that is because up until very recently, I think we were very bad at diagnosing it. If you don't treat it uh, um, immediately and aggressively, the, the visual outcome is poor. But I think now that we can, now that we have this blood testing mm -hmm. and we're more, more aware of the mm -hmm. disease, I think, I don't think, I think it's still going to be not as good as atopic neuritis, but I'm hoping that numbers are going to be. Yeah, I hope and so too. Final, thank you. Final comment um, I wanted to make. Um, you said suspect NMO when, which I think is a little further now. Yeah, the other thing is that um, I, I think certain ethnic groups are more likely to have NMO yes. compared to Caucasian. Mm -hmm, that's true. I know like Southeast Asia, like for mm -hmm. sure, they, they have way more NMO. Yep, and African Americans, Afro Brazilians, Caribbean oh. populations as well, okay. are found to have higher population or higher uh, prevalence of that. Okay, yeah. good. So that's another thing that's kind of mm -hmm. in mind. It was a great presentation. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Warren. So I uh, just you know, you want to go to your uh, your source. Uh, it's all very fine and large for the uh, the working group on NMO spectrum disorders to make recommendations, and interestingly. They're the ones who, they're the only ones currently who offer the cell-based assay. So they may have a little bit of yeah. bias towards doing the most difficult and expensive test first. Uh, you know, I think that I think that most of us would have the practice because of the specificity of the test. If you order it through ARDP and it's positive, and the clinical syndrome fits, then you don't have to do the cell-based assay. I think that most of us probably end up doing the cell-based assay if we're really thinking that it is NMO and we're wanting to have a confirmation. Although I think, again, most of us, if we really think that it's NMO, would end up treating it as such, um, even if, even in the face of a negative test because of the slightly limited sensitivity. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that um, Brad's point about ethnic variation is extremely important. Uh, the other thing is um, there's a lot of practice variation in who to test for NMO, 
And so Dr. Degree, for instance, advocates uh, testing for NMO in anybody with osteoporosis. Um, and I think that there are those of us who might say, well, you know, perhaps if the MRI scan is absolutely classic for MS and, you know, they, they've had a nice relapsing remitting course that just all sounds like MS uh, and they haven't had any of the other spectrum disorder stuff, then it's maybe okay not to test it. Because uh, it's, it's not, a, not an inexpensive test. I don't know the exact cost, but I'm you know, pretty convinced that it's, that it's not like a CBC. Right. Uh, so I, you know, I think that some people would uh, advocate varying <coughs> levels of testing and aggressiveness for it. Mm -hmm. I can see that definitely. Is pain very helpful in these patients with osteoporosis? Is that a safety factor? No. In MS and, you know, it's no. Really both pain. It can be painful for both. So what happened to your lady? Well, she's coming back to see uh, Dr. Stacy Clardy soon, uh, actually tomorrow, but um, to follow up, see how she does tomorrow. Because I think in her case, you know, there was a, a very strong case we made for it be potentially being ischemic optical neuropathy because of the lack of enhancement of the nerve, because mm -hmm. of the swelling of the nerve, right. um, et cetera. We'll have to see what happens. Exactly, yeah. Was her neuro test positive? It was positive, yeah. yeah. Um, well, there's in the literature at least there's like a, there's a wide range of presentations, um, so they can be found in children and adults. But usually, the median age of presentation is in like mid 30s. Uh, 